Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Dan Garza again for part two of our Peisty History episode. Welcome back, Dan. Thanks. It's, I can't believe it's we're doing this again. I know. This is, honestly, it's very, it's different than most other episodes, because usually it's, you know, one and done, but I think Peisty's special, and I'm really, really glad. It's pretty cool to, like, uh, to do this, where we've had a week. Today is Saturday, November 20th, so this is only a couple days before we will release this. Um, but to see people's reaction, and I've gotten a lot of messages, um, a lot of cool stuff from people just saying how much they've enjoyed it. Um, cause let's be honest, that was a long, that was a long episode. Oh yeah. So, uh, um, oh, yeah. people are really interested in Peisty and they, as they should be, um, it's neat to get this information out there. Thanks to like Fritz and this long list of people who maybe will, you know, shout out at the end. But, um, I think it's cool to finally put it all together. H- how are you feeling after part one is out in the world? Are you happy? Oh yeah. It's, you know, it, it, there's just so much information and listening to it, it was like, man, I'm going on forever. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten feedback. I've been working with Fritz over the last week. Uh, we've been focusing on, on, on mostly, pre- well, trying to find something about pre-war Peisty, yeah. uh, some actual documentation or proof, you know, but yeah, I've had a few people contact me and and offer some information, which is really interesting. Just little tidbits here and there, but yeah. it definitely helps with with the whole timeline. Sure, um, and you know maybe it's worth saying this too that like if you're listening to this right now and you didn't listen to part one, um, you just just know that like that. All right, so the first one was basically about the origins of the family um, up through you know the different factories and the moving around Europe and the being refugees and um, the Ludwig connection, which um, on that note, I want to give a big shout out real quick though to uh, Jim Catalano, who on Facebook has been posting some really cool pictures of Bill Ludwig with the Peisty family going back when it was, you know, they were, they were traveling together and um, really neat stuff. So thank you to Jim Catalano for his continued support. uh, Who's, he was a longtime Ludwig employee and he's, Got a really cool episode um, on his uh, with with him on the show. So, yeah. All right. So, um, Dan, why don't we start off? I know uh, the benefit of having this part two is that we've gotten um, a couple corrections. One of them is from uh, Norbert from Meinl and um, a couple, you know, different things where he loved the episode. But there was a, some stuff where he said, hey, this isn't 100 percent right. Here's the correct information. And I know you've got some other ones. So do you want to start with the. The housekeeping section and we can sure. clean things up a little bit uh, sure. that maybe got you know again we have the benefit to do it now so I'll, I'll let you take that away so i you know I, I keep you know this is obviously a living breathing thing as far as trying to learn about the history of piety and you know I've, i have several sources and it's really difficult for to find anything that pre-war pre-world war ii and honestly there isn't anything that I could find. Yeah. What I did realize I made a major error in that Peisty was working with nickel silver w- way back in easily the thirties, if not the twenties. And the proof is that their gongs were made from nickel silver. Um, and it can't be understated, you know, how important Peisty's gongs were to their business and their success. Um, but my understanding is the Stambuls were always nickel silver Um, I don't have an official start date. And and honestly, I don't think anybody really knows when Pisces started to make the Stambul series. You know, the the timeline that I have says 1932, but because there's no documentation, there's no way to prove that 100%. Mm -hmm. The other thing I found, too, of searching pre-war catalogs, all these different drum manufacturers, is I found Zildjian Zilko's pre-war. And I thought, oh, man, they had a second line. And then I found out, that wasn't a second line. Those were Azilgent seconds or rejects that they just labeled Zilco and sold as a lower price symbol. Yeah, yeah, which is which is sort of a gray area too, because it's like, what's the definition of like a second line? Because that's yeah, you know. But I think that's good to clarify that that it, instead of it, it being a this is a second separate line that is created from scratch for this purpose, not just 
oh, that one didn't quite make the grade or it's not the right whatever. Um, so here now it goes over here. It wasn't specifically created. Yeah. All right. So then uh, shall we discuss um, Norbert and the Minel um, difference there? Yes. Um, so basically, my understanding is that the profile and record series uh, were not the first B8 symbols that Minel produced. They actually were producing B8 in the 70s. Um, which I believe was the King Beat series. And they also released another model called the Laser. So, you know, I was definitely in error as far as Minel's history. So I apologize for that. Oh, that's all right. And again, Norbert was super nice and was like, hey, Bart, hope you're going to have a good time at PASIC coming up, which was fun. That's my my uh, my PASIC recap. It was It was awesome and it was a great time. It was good to see everyone there. But um, uh, which I mentioned in the last episode. But yeah, then he was just, you know, here's a little bit of information. Um no big issue. Just wanted to give you some facts. And uh, again, super nice. So now I think we're good to just jump in and pick up the timeline, right? Yeah, I was thinking if it's OK, that we could do a real quick lightning round. I love it. Of of, of factoids. And and this would this would a lot of this is information I've picked up in the last week that doesn't really fit or was in the old part of the timeline. So sure. I could go ahead and start with. um Looking more into the relationship between Ludwig and Piesty, what I found is that um, traditionally in Europe, there is a city called, and I'm going to try to pronounce this here, it's called Mark Neukirchen in southeastern Germany, right on the Czech border. And that was the center of production for musical instruments for centuries. And they would have a huge music fair every year. This goes back well, well into the 1800s. It was basically the European NAM, the 18th and 19th century NAM for Europe. And all the major manufacturers went there, including the Zildjians. Now, this would be the the, the family that produced K Zildjians mm-hmm. uh, pre-war. And um, Father Piesty, Mikhail, would definitely have gone there to sell his gongs. And there isn't concrete proof, but... You know, speaking with well, this is something that Fritz brought up. We're we're pretty certain that both Ludwig Senior and Mikhail would have been there. They would have met. They would have at least you know exchanged business cards. But they knew each other. And the reason why this is important is because in the previous podcast I mentioned that Robert Robert Peisty had mentioned in his interview that the Ludwig family had sent them care packages right after World War II. So. They knew who the Peisty family was, and the only way that would have been possible is if they would have done business or known them before the war. So that kind of wraps up that little sure. tidbit. Yeah, good info. Um, another interesting factoid from the early 50s, and this was actually in Robert's interview, was that Father Peisty McHale had received a call from a salesman. This was probably right around early 50s when they started using their hammering machine. And he received a call from a salesman trying to sell them basically an automated machine that would produce the symbol. And I guess one fell swoop. It probably would stamp it and then sure. it had another function for hammering. And the salesman was trying to sell it to, to Mikhail. And he replied, a machine for making symbols. You can forget that. We don't make pots and pans. We make symbols. <laughs> and what ironic is the salesman that was trying to sell this, the, the machine to uh, Father Peisty was Roland Meinl. Oh, wow. That's funny. <laughs> the, the founder of Meinl. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> cool. Okay, another tidbit. Um, the Pisces Drummer Service, which I mentioned briefly uh, uh, on the last podcast uh, with Robert, uh, was headed up by Pierre Fave, I believe is the correct pronunciation of his last name. And he was the driving force for decades behind that. I, I believe it was Robert's idea, and he basically started it. But Pierre was the one who headed that that project. Hmm. Pierre also was the lead symbol tester, from what I was told, for decades. He was the main symbol tester. There's also pictures of him in the old Ludwig documentation of when Ludwig went to visit Peisty and pick out symbols. Pierre was there working with Robert Yeager pulling the symbols out and explaining them to him. So he was like the number one, like technical advisor hmm. for Piesty. Wow. Uh, the, the other person who, who needs to be mentioned is Freddie Studer. And my understanding is that Freddie and Pierre were, were key people as far as the, um, uh, the development of new symbols. Uh, my understanding, and this is new information I got is that Pierre was responsible for cup chimes, 
the bell, uh, extra heavy bell symbols, and it goes on and on and on. Mm. But those people are obviously key to to Peisty's, uh creative creativeness. Yeah. Another thing, real quick, is uh, Swiss metal. As we spoke in the last podcast, was originally no- called their their name was Metalwerk Dornach AG, mm. and AG is the same thing as Incorporated. That was Swiss Metal's original name before they became Swiss Metal, who produced, uh, I believe, B8 and B20 for Pisces up until 94. Mm. Um, Weiland Works, Weiland Works took over uh, the B8 production. And I found out through Fritz from a firsthand account, Fritz was in Ca- at the Sabian plant in Canada. Weiland Works supplies B8 to Zildjian and Sabian for all their B8 symbols. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> wow. Man, you've done more and more uh, homework. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I've got one more. Sure. This is this is a this is an industry one. So Fritz is a, a friend who is a huge Bonham fan. Uh, and this this German gentleman, Fritz told me, was constantly badgering Eric Peisty about finding Bonham's uh, endorsement agreement. And he badgered him for God knows probably years. Eric finally gave in and went in and went to the archives and found Bonham's um, endorsement agreement, the contract, and basically the inventory list of what symbols that they gave Bonham. When you go to Peisty's site and you see the picture of the endorsement and that inventory list, the reason why they, they basically, not that they don't have it, but the reason why they can actually produce it is because this German Bonham fan uh, pestered Eric's you know, incessantly until he actually went and found it. Man, that is awesome. That's such history, that document. <laughs> <laughs> you know? The the other thing that this, I don't know the gentleman's name, Fritz does, obviously. Um, he also pestered Pisces. This would have been around early 2000s. He pestered Pisces to uh, do a special order and, and to make him a set of giant beat symbols, which they weren't producing at the time. So Pisces went ahead and did that. and. One of the things I understood with Pisces is that if you do a special order, you have to order two of everything. Mm. So there is two complete sets. And right after they produce a symbol, Steve Jordan, who is famous because he used to be the drummer for David Letterman, yep. and he's been a Pisces player for decades. He was in Notwell, and he saw the giant beats that had just been produced. And he went over, and he was talking to one of the Pisces guys. says, well, what is this? Let me play with these. So he really liked them. He said, well, I want a set too. And they're like, okay. So they made him a custom order set. He takes them back to LA. And then a bunch of his buddies see him. They're like, well, we want them too. So they started doing all these custom orders for Giant Beats. That's how Giant Beats, the main reason why they're reissued was the demand. Wow. And it was an originally started by this German, big German Bonham fan. <laughs> that guy, uh, we, we owe a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, that's that's it's really cool though that something could be so you know, loved long ago and then brought back because some one, one person, maybe there was a couple people involved. That's just benefit of the doubt. But like one person was so passionate that it actually, they listened. So Peisty actually listened and, and, and did it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, and, and I have to say that I just saw Steve Jordan playing with the Rolling Stones in Detroit last in between our two episodes. And, uh, it was awesome. But for the sake of time, I'll talk about that <laughs> another time. Okay. But, um, all right. So now, Let's hop in here. Uh, we're, I, I promise to everyone this episode is going to be shorter than an hour and a half like the last one. So <laughs> let's do our best here to keep it. You know, we got another 40 or 50 minutes. Um, so let's jump in here, Dan, and pick it up where we left off, which was uh, in the 1970s. And we kind of touched on getting into the 2002 series, which is very iconic with rock. So let's let's pick it up here and um, carry on the the Peisty timeline. You got it. So the period of 70, 71, a lot of stuff happened, obviously, with the release of 2002s. The other thing that happened, which is really important, is what I call the great B8 shift of 1971. And that was Pisces dropped nickel silver from all their lower lines, and all their lower lines were switched over to being produced from B8. And that includes the Stambul, the Dixie, the Super, the Ludbrook Standard, the Stenopel. Um, and you can actually find these symbols, uh, on German eBay. They, they're still around. Hmm. 
And they're, they're interesting. I mean, they're actually decent sounding symbols now that they're made from B8. You know, from my personal perspective, I think they're more desirable. Yeah. Um, and this, in, I'm kind of inferring or, or making an assumption that Pisces did this a lot of ways for economic reasons because of the fact that they were, getting, they were starting the production of the 2002 and they would only need two alloys now instead of three. Mm-hmm. They would just need B20 and B8, uh, which probably made production a little simpler. Yeah, cleaner. Um, Robert knew that they needed a symbol to compete with the amplified music of the time, which yep. was getting louder and louder and louder when we get into the 70, 71. So that became the 2002. And it's safe to say that really the sound of 70s rock, virtually every English rock band, um, their drummer used Pisces cymbals. I mean, you could probably would be easier to name the drummers that didn't use 2002s throughout the 70s if they're an English band. Or even or or a European band for that matter. Which in in you know, you kind of look back. I was obviously I mean, I was not born yet, but I you, you like you listen to the radio, you listen to this this amazing music, and it's like a lot of these bands were were European, British bands at the time that we all love now. But I mean, I'm looking on uh the symbol dot wiki Peisty, you know, section though, and it's Bonham, Alex Van Halen, who's America, not born in America, but American by band. Um, Cozy Powell, Carl Palmer, Ian Pace, um, Carmine Apice, uh, let's see, Ainsley Dunbar, um, Keith Moon, right? Yeah. Um, Steve Smith, Andy Parker of UFO, uh, Graham Lear of Santana, Barry Moore Barlow with Jethro Tull. I mean, it just goes Charlie Watts. Um, it's just in St. Phil Rudd, Roger Taylor. I mean, these are the biggest names this and Nick Mason, obviously, this had to be just like pretty amazing for the Peisty family. Because I remember when we when on, on part one, we were referring to a section of their history where um, they were kind of down financially and they had to yeah. be making the like uh, chains for snow tires and all that stuff. Um, but I mean, this explosion had to be good for business, obviously. Yeah. And yeah, and, and they were, they were, it's funny because yeah, they didn't have much of a presence in the U S during this period of time. Um, it really isn't until 1975 when Rogers took over distribution mm. that I don't, I don't, I don't know who distributed symbols in the U S from 70, 71 up until 75, mm. if anybody, but in Europe, it wasn't a problem, you know, obviously. And, you know, this is the music I grew up on and, and, you know, when you listen back to all these bands, you realize it's virtually, and most of them are Ludwig and Peisty, you know, they kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, I always thought as a kid, for some odd reason, that like Bonham played before I really looked. I mean, I'm talking like when I was like 10, I always thought Bonham played Zildjian for some odd reason. You almost think sometimes like you, maybe you think everyone plays Ludwig because that's what the big name, yeah. that, you know, every parent <laughs> knows and talks to you about. But but no, it's it's uh, amazing how how popular Peisty was. So um, and just to reiterate, though, obviously these are B eight symbols, two thousand twos. If you could put in a couple words, be like uh, people loved these because of how clear and bright they were. Is that fair to say? Getting over the music, it cuts through. It's this new kind of rock music. Is that basically yeah. the the gist of it? Yeah, B8, especially the way they developed the 2002s, you know, I mentioned in the last podcast, I think, about um, in the old days, pennies were made out of copper. Yep. And if you take a copper penny and throw it against a hard surface like a concrete floor, you hear this really characteristic high-frequency ring. And that's that ring. I also, in the old days, when you had telephones, they actually had telephone bells in them, and the, you know, People have uh, on their cell phones the uh, ringtone of an old-fashioned telephone. Sure, that telephone bell ring also reminded me of that high-frequency ring that 2002s in particular have, mm. and you could hear it, and that really cuts through. And there's this sweetness to the characteristics that you could hear, you know, that cuts through all the guitars and vocals and keyboards and God knows what that comes out up top. That really sounds really sweet. Yeah, that's you know, a great way to put it. If I could back up a little bit, this, this is just little sure. little tidbits of information. One thing that's important that's that's really contested is uh, Pisces serial numbers. 
Okay. And this is this is something I see constantly, and I've actually spent a lot of time trying to understand and gather data. Um, Pisces did not apply serial numbers to their symbols until 1972. People constantly say, well, they did it in 1970 because the serial number's got a zero on it. Mm. Now, that's a, that's a 1980 serial number. Um, there was oh, also a transition period um, in 71. The very early 2002s didn't have serial numbers, and they also didn't have the 2002 name on them. It just had Peisty stamped on them, and that's mm. listed on the wiki. And 602s had the same thing where they just had the name Peisty, mm. and it didn't say Formula 602 above it. Gotcha. Um, yeah. That's what you call the, the transition labels or the transition symbols. Sure. But it's important. It's important to understand because you know, Pisces started applying serial numbers in '72, and they were the only ones. I mean, I I have, I don't have the data, but my understanding is Zildjian didn't start doing serial numbers until the mid '90s, if that. Wow. Wow. So the nice thing is, is that you can actually date the top line Pisces, mainly 602s and 2002s. At the lower lines. It looks like more mid seventies when they started to apply serial numbers. It was hit and miss. Mm. Yeah, that's good to know. Now in this modern time of like, I don't know, like you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. It's like, yeah, of course you have to have a serial number because these things are going to go out there and they're going to be valuable yeah. and people will want them. But it's it's that's good to know for for dating purposes. There's other things happening too. I mean, if we stick with the timeline, seventy one ish was um, the uh, creation of the dark ride. With the, with the uh, cooperation of John Heisman and Jack DeJanet. Um, this is interesting in that they, in a lot of ways, were trying to reproduce the old K sound. So you've got yeah. a symbol that's heavily hammered and much darker sounding than the standard 602s, because this is based on a 602 symbol. Yeah. Um, this is considered, from my understanding, the most valuable Pisces ever made. Hmm. Wow. Uh, especially the dark ride version. Um, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but this ended up developing a whole series called the Sound Creation Series, which in 1978, which is basically, uh, you know, Peisty's version of would be their their K Zildjians in a lot of ways. Most of the symbols were heavily hammered and much darker sounding. Mm. And you know, it should be noted that this was done in 78 and released in 78 before Zildjian officially revamped or restarted their k line in 1982 hmm. wow even more uh who did it first kind of uh <laughs> yeah so pisces was definitely ahead of the curve yeah. on that yeah cool all right so chugging along then um what else in the early 70s well at some point i think we're gonna have to talk about bonham yeah yeah for sure so <laughs> <laughs> let's keep it. <laughs> we could spend an episode on Bonham. So let's yeah. let's touch on Bonham a little bit. I mean, that's just obviously one of the most influential drummers in the world. I mean, of all time to this day. So so the fact that he played Peisty, boy, that that had to be that's their Ringo, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I I again, I've had people recently in the last few weeks send me information, which has been really helpful. There is a section on the wiki page under the giant beat symbols at the very bottom that has a whole section with Bonham's ador- endorsement agreement and his inventory list that kind of lays out, um, you know, what he played and when he played it. And a mm. lot of this is with the help of a gentleman by the name of George Flutus, who is on uh, YouTube, who's a fantastic drummer, and he's done all this research. Um, he plays virtually every Zeppelin song, and he plays them very, very well. But he's pointed out with pictures from particular eras what Bonham was playing, and it's very interesting. Uh, in a nutshell, Bonham actually played Giant Beats on more albums than he did 2002s. Mm, interesting. Which, which I found very interesting. I mean, growing yeah. up, I always thought it was just 2002, 2002, 2002. And it turns out that he played Giant Beats all the way up uh, through Houses of the Holy. And uh, he was using Formula 602 hi-hats on all those early albums. Um, Led Zeppelin one is really kind of anybody's guess because there just isn't any information as far as any real picture evidence around that time. It's hard to tell, hmm. but most people agree that it's a mixture of 602 giant beats and Zildjian's. Um, we also think that there was an influence from Ludwig because he got his, uh, his, uh, clear maple set or, uh, a thermal gloss, I think is referred mm-hmm. to it. Um, in 
early 69, I believe, with the help of Carmine, of course. Yep. 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 <laughs> and it's believed that most likely Ludwig gave him a set of 602s at that time to go along with the set. Because at that point, um, they would have had them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And they were selling and distributing them. Yeah. Um, but there's also there's also proof, and uh, there's actually an interview with Freddie Studer who mentions that Bonham had come to the factory in very early 1970, which is it, it was on his inventory list, where you see he picked up a full set of Giant Beats. Hmm. Um, there's also an interview I read with Cozy Powell where he mentioned that both him and Bonham were buddies in the late 60s, and they were on the, the same club circuit together playing in different bands, and they both found Giant Beats in the late 60s and were playing them. And the interesting thing they said is that they had problems with cracking their Zildjian's. So when they started using Giant Beats, they found they didn't have that that issue as much or at all. And that was one of the big advantages. Hmm, yeah, because um, these are heavy hitting. I mean, it's a new world of yeah. music, you know. It, wow. My understanding also is that um, Bonham was disappointed when they discontinued Giant Beats in 72 slash early 73. And he continued to play them, and he could he especially liked his ride, and he continued to use that ride through physical graffiti. So when you listen to the actual tracks recorded for that album, he's using 2002s, but he's still using his giant beat ride, and he toured with it. So when you look at the 75 tour, the physical graffiti tour, he's still using his giant beat ride. Hmm. And it's not until presence that he's using all 2002s. Wow. That's awesome. And then a 602 medium ride thrown in here or there. Man, just such a cool, I don't know, something about that that sound of Zeppelin is is Peisty, you know? Yeah. For, as far as the oh, drums yeah. go, that's that's so cool to know. Um, all right. And then, like I said, there there will be, at some point, I don't know when, but there, there will be a full Bonham episode without a doubt. Um, but yeah, was was he like, I mean, you know, was he the top dog really? I mean, I guess, I guess also we kind of like make him a legend more and more after the fact, you know, cause he's been gone for so long, but did they realize at Peisty? Do you think at that time that like this guy is a big deal and we need to take care of him? Um, was he kind of the big dog on the endorser list? I think a lot of it had to do with the band. Mm-hmm. Um, well, of course. The one thing obviously that younger listeners can't really relate to is that, I mean, really, it wasn't until the 90s that you didn't have access to these bands. And Mm -hmm. really, the only way, and this is my experience as a kid, was the only way that you you would hear these bands on the radio and you'd have to wait till the song was over, then the DJ would announce who it was and like what the name of the song was. And if you're lucky, what album it was on. And I would have to go to the record store to find the album if I wanted to listen to that song and buy the album, obviously. Yeah, But the other thing is I would go to the supermarket and look for either cream or circus magazines because Mm -hmm. that was the only way that you'd be able to actually see the band, see what they look like. And as all drummers know, it's like, what was the guy playing? I mean, that's, you know, all your, your, your idols, what was he playing? So I would page through the new issue of cream or circus looking for Zeppelin pictures. There was a Zeppelin article and it's like, you know, where's the pictures of Bonham? It's like, I don't care about plant or page. I want to see the Bonham pictures. And usually you would see part of a set from a shot taken of Robert Plant, you know, standing yeah. in front of a set. It's like, get out of the way. I want to see Bonham <laughs> set, you know? Yeah, totally. So, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it, Zeppelin had this aura about them. Um, I've read a couple of different biographies. They were very groundbreaking uh, in that, um, they changed the way business was done in the industry, especially uh, with performing live. Um, but more importantly, they didn't do interviews. They didn't release singles. There was only Zeppelin only ever re- uh, uh, released one single. Uh, but the main thing was that they had really bad um, reception from the press very early on, Rolling Stone. And they decided that they weren't going to cater to the media. So they were non-existent. So they became this very mythical band. And I think that really drove their the aura about them and their popularity, the fact that they were so inaccessible. Yeah. And that sure. really drove a, a lot of their popularity, the fact that they were that you just you didn't know anything about them. And there were there were never no interviews. You know, all you saw were pictures of magazines. So for young fans, you know, they had a rabid following. So I'm sure Peisty, it's some 
former manor knew about that. Obviously, they were very yeah. popular in Europe, you know. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It, it obviously cool. they had they had a lot of other top endor- endorsees, but as far as volume, the amount of albums sold or the amount of tickets sold for concerts, you know, Zeppelin was number one. Yeah, for sure. You know? Which is important. As- especially in the U S yeah, absolutely. Which perfect segue getting back to the U S distribution. Let's talk about Rogers and, uh, which who was owned by CBS. Yeah. And it's interesting kind of reading on the wiki here, talking about how part of the deal was Peisty would distribute Rogers drums in Switzerland. So there was a bit of a, uh, back and forth because these are such distant places where they needed help obviously to have, feet on the ground in those places so it makes sense let's let's talk about the um distribution here a little bit how did that all go well i i could tell you really from a personal perspective because this is when i started playing you know i started playing the drums in 78 and i got my first peisty in 79 i got a 404 six inch crash and my experience and also from looking at catalogs and whatnot um rogers first listed 2002s in their 76 catalog. So initially, they only offered 2002s. Um, as you get later into the 70s, um, you'll see that they do offer sound creations. And by 78, which is when uh, the Dixie and the Istanbul are, are discontinued, they basically morphed into the 505 and the 404. Um, Rogers did offer the 404, and that's where I came in. Mm. But what was very interesting is once I started to work on the wiki and started to contact people in Europe and make friends and this and that, I found that there was all these symbols that were available in Europe that we never got. You know, I mean, we never, we never got Stambouls or Dixies here in the U S let alone. I mean, what we got was through Ludwig, which would have been the standard where they also produced an even less expensive line called the Stenopel Mm -hmm. in the late sixties, early seventies. But that was it. Now, Rogers, for whatever reason, didn't distribute 602s in the U.S. Uh, on uh, one of their price lists from 1980, they list the 602s as a special order, and it takes a 100-day turnaround to, de- to basically deliver the symbol. Um, so the, the selection was limited. Even the sizes available of 2002s were limited in the U.S. compared to what they had in Europe. Hmm. So th- Rogers still did very well as far as the volume. Of of the amount of symbols they sold, obviously, yeah, um, yeah. I I I don't really know why they stopped. I would assume it was because Peisty came to the realization of, well, geez, you know, if we're doing this well in the U.S., we might as well set up a distribution center and do it ourselves, which would make a lot of sense. Which is yeah. what they what they did in 1981. Yeah, which there's something, you know, it's sort of going down the same path. Obviously, it didn't end the same way, but with Ludwig, about kind of latching on a little bit to a successful drum company to get, you know, reach a wider audience and have the distribution and stuff. But, but yeah, I guess at that point with their, their, it was different than the earlier Ludwig distribution, obviously, because they were bigger and more well-known with these bands. So they probably did feel more confident to take that step out on their own, um, to, you know, we we can do this on our own. Hmm. And I think by the late seventies, Pisces was doing pretty well with the 2002s yeah. um this is i don't have the source i honestly can't remember where this where the statement came from but i did read a statement a long time ago that uh rogers or cbs actually did more volume with pisces than they did with rogers drums in other words they sold more and and dollar wise more made more money off the the 2002s or gross dollars mm. than they did off of the actual rogers drums Wow. Which is pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I kind of get <laughs> that's it. That's the case. In yeah. some, in some, like, I remember I, I used to work at Guitar Center in the drum department, and it was like, yeah, you sell more sticks than you do uh, Tama Bubinga drum sets. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. people are going to buy more cymbals than they are going to buy a full drum set. So, yeah. But I'm sure Rogers was kind of like, geez, why are we selling, you know, we, uh, this is, it's just an interesting uh, dichotomy, I guess you could say. Here's another thing to keep in mind, too, is, Number one, all there was was Zildjian and Peisty in the U.S. Yeah. Um, I do know, I have a catalog, a Gretsch catalog from 1980, where they actually distribute UFIPs. Mm. And you see these little, when I was growing up, 
you would have these kind of funky off-brand symbols. I mean, one of the things that floated around is the kids in my neighborhood. I remember one kid had a camber symbol. Mm -hmm. Another kid had a caret symbol. But as far as entry-level symbols go, they were kind of, one, they weren't very good. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of one of the major advantages Peisty had was even though it was, it was only the 404, they were selling probably a lot of 404s in the U.S. because, you know, Zildjian didn't have a second line of symbols. You know, sure. they all they had were a Zildjians all through the 70s yeah. and the 60s. You know, I mean, I know that there was the ASCO plant and they did start to produce Ks, I think, at 78. But my understanding is that the companies really weren't connected. I mean, Zildjian didn't offer Ks in their catalog until around 82. No, and I think uh, part of the split, uh, you know, again, sorry if I'm wrong, there's a lot of history. Uh, part of the split between Robert and Armand was, I believe, one of them wanted to have a second, less expensive line, and the other one didn't. And I can't remember if exactly. I think it was Zildjian. Um, I think Robert didn't want to have a cheaper line, and and Armin wanted to start to lower and get into that later in the '80s. Obviously, was when that would be. This episode is brought to you by Dream Symbols. Dream Symbols is continuing the tasting tour 2021 with a couple new dates I wanted to let you guys know about. Saturday, November 27th, they'll be at Portman's Music Superstore in Savannah, Georgia. If you haven't heard, they're going to have a lot of cool symbols in store. They're going to have a member of the Dream Team on site, and they'll be doing the recycling program. Go check it out. All right, so you mentioned this earlier. They were going to have their own distribution center. Um, And I just want to, like, let's do a little check-in on Europe. So we still have the German factory, and we still have the Swiss factory, correct? That's correct. German factory is... Producing all the all the B eight lines, in, including two thousand twos, but it's the domestic market. It's Germany mm. and most likely Central Europe only. Um, during that period, you'll you'll never see any seventies German Pisces in the U S. Mm. You know, it was only Switzerland. Switzerland was the only one that ex- exported their symbols to, to the U S. or North America through that period. Now, I believe in the eighties, I think we did start to get some German lower line. Heisty symbols. Uh, gotcha. I, I would have to f- find actual find proof of it, which would be difficult, but I, I believe that is the case. Yeah. Um, but in mm. the 70s, no. And and what's interesting is that um, there's one gentleman that I that I actually contacted me, and he has this enormous collection. He's got all these 505s in Istanbul, and he has all these 505s from the late 70s. And I'm like, I can't believe, I didn't know they made all this. You know, they, <laughs> they made a, a marching China type. Wow. You know, and it's, I'm looking at this thing. This is so cool. It's like, we never got this. We, we didn't get any marching symbols. We didn't get any hand symbols. There's a little excerpt at the bottom of the price list saying hand symbols available on request, which basically means special order. Yeah, sure. But they don't tell you what's available. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't know that you could get 602 concert sound edges. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. It's almost it kind of makes me think of like when you see like car companies who make cars in Europe that as here in America, we've never even heard of or seen or in, in like in Asia where it's like Ford or something. They make these things that literally we'll never see or drive yeah. ever. Um, and it's yeah. it's super similar to that. Um, so, all right, while we're kind of like while we're over in Europe checking in. So we still Robert. Tumas, everyone, they're they're still running the show. The family is still very much in charge, right? No one has been yep. sold to another company or anything. It's still a family operation. No. Also, one more thing about the German factory. My understanding was that um, you know, Father Peisty passed away in '63, and and Mother Peisty, which would be Robert and Tumas's mother, took over in some form or manner of hmm. running the factory in Germany, and and. I'm sure she, in some ways, at some point became more of a figurehead, but she lived in that little house next door to the factory until she passed away. Wow. So I I thought that was very interesting. It's, you know, all in the family. (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly right. My understanding is uh, when Eric visits a German factory, that's where he stays. Oh, cool. And is in his grandmother's house. Wow. That's cool. (laughs) All right, then let's pick up back there and kind of go from the 70s into the 80s. And if we're, correct me if I'm missing anything, but let's maybe jump. Um, let's hear about the distribution center or if there's any other lines along the way there. Well, I already kind of mentioned it, but the Sound Creation series was released in 78. Yeah. And it's kind of a mysterious series. It was a, it was very expensive. 
but I own several sound creation symbols. And I have to tell you that I absolutely love the sound creation series. And there's a lot of like really hardcore sound creation fans that, that want Pisces to bring them back. But honestly, the 602 Modern Essentials series is really kind of the grandson of sound creation in a lot of ways. That was the same general intent was to make a more exotic, darker, uh, you know, deeper sounding type of symbol. And again, they're basic, you know, they're basically 602s that have been heavily hammered. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and the sound changed quite a bit, but I, I still love the sound creation series and um, there's quite a few of them still around and the dark ride continued all the way through the seventies and eighties with the sound creation series. And, the Sound Creation series and the 602s were discontinued in 94 because uh, Swiss Metal ran into financial difficulties and they stopped producing B20. So for mm. people out there wondering why they stopped producing these symbols, that's the reason why. Wow. You know, it's it's just a, you know, it's 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 obviously a thing. It's it's the symbol companies rely so much on the, you know, metal manufacturers that that controls a lot. There's a lot of forces at play that can can affect, um, you know, the creation of a line or a symbol. It's like, well, we can't do it anymore. We lost our distributor. So that's that's just yeah. an interesting side note. Brea Distribution Center. So Brea is pretty much due east, a little southeast of downtown Los Angeles. So I was really happy that they uh, decided to to uh, establish the distribution center here because it was close to me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. What I what I can tell you from a personal perspective was I I grew up here. I moved back east for three years from 79 to 82. And then I, I was back here in the summer of 82. So Brea had really just got up and running by then. And I was buying my Pisces back east and I had bought a 404. Then I moved up to 2002s. And it was very difficult. I had to drive into Boston. Well, I had to get my dad or my parents to, to drive into Boston in order to go to a music store to buy them. And the selection was pretty thin, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but I very strongly remember when we moved out here in the summer of 82, the first thing I did was hit the music stores. And of course, there was Guitar Center, which was the old school Guitar Center. I mean, it was ground zero for Pisces. And I can remember walking into the old Guitar Center before they moved it in Hollywood. And the drum section, the center of the drum section was this huge Pisces display. And they had a percussion set, if, if uh, the, the listeners know what that is. And they had racks and racks of 2002s. And, and, and this is when they did the, the color label shift yeah. in 81. So no more black labels. They're all colored labels. They had green label 505s. They had brown label 404s. They had a ton of 2002s. And oh my God, a 602. I saw my first 602 <laughs> for the first time, you know? And yeah. I think they even had sound creations. And I knew what everything was because I had the catalogs, but I had never seen this stuff in person. Hmm. Um, this also coincides with what I like to call the uh, the beginning of the hair metal phase yep. in LA. And so the Sunset Strip, and that was ground zero for all those hair metal bands like Rat and and Quiet Riot, and Motley Crue, and Poison, all those bands all originated out of that area. And the majority of those guys all play Pisces. They all play 2002s. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that Pisces had such a strong presence now in the U.S., and especially in L.A., and now all of a sudden you've got MTV within about a year or less of Pisces uh, uh, establishing their distribution center, so now all of a sudden you've got these drummers, you know, I vividly remember that rat video constantly playing <laughs> on MTV and yeah. you can actually, you can clearly see the drummers playing 2002s. You could see the, the red label Pisces yeah. underneath the symbols. So, you know, they got free advertising, you know, they got huge exposure in the U S because of that. So totally again, this is, this is my, this is my impression. Yeah. I really think that, they they really blew up and in the US. I and mean, the US is such a gigantic market. Totally. Another thing that's really, really important, if we back up just a year, was Pisces released the Rude series in 1980. 
And that was, you know, their unlathed symbols. And again, that was Peisty, in, you know, being innovative and producing these symbols for metal, punk rock, really, really loud music. Sure. And probably one of the, the main endorsees that everybody knows about is Stuart Copeland. And he started using Rudes on Ghost of the Machine. And you could hear them. He's actually mixing 602s and Rudes, which is pretty crazy, but it works. And um, that also was the incentive for the colored label era because Paiste had printed the big white Rude label on the symbol. And that basically started the whole era of now they're going to actually print big logos on the symbols in color, which are easy to see. Totally. And it's free advertising. Yeah. And, and oh my God. I mean, that the colored look, I mean, I consider myself a bit of like an outsider. Again, you are like the Peisty expert, but I just have to say that the colored logos, even getting further down a little bit, the the actual literally colored symbols, which I'm I'm sure we'll talk about. But those colors, I just think of that red 2002. And I, I I used to have a 2002 crash. Man, it just pops. It is such a unique. And that green on the 505, it's so just, yeah. it draws your eye to it. And it's like, this is different. And and it makes sense that it's because, um, you know, there's there's music videos. There's all the stuff they know advertising. And that's that's really effective. And another interesting note is Zildjian's didn't start to label their symbols or put their logo which they call the hollow logo and the bottom of the symbols mm-hmm. until I believe 1978, mm. which Pisces started in 72. Gotcha. Um, and I believe, I think in 81 ish or 82 is when, when Zildjian went to the solid black logo and the bottom of the symbols. But my, again, this is my interpretation that I believe Pisces led the way again with this and, and they continued innovating. I mean, it was, you know, the percussion set was, was absolutely, I, I remember seeing it and it had the most odd things in it. You know, the roto sound and cup chimes and these little tiny gongs, a sound plate, this big rectangular piece of bronze, um, you know, the bell symbol, um, obviously the flat ride. I mean, it goes on and on and on. But the probably one of the biggest things that really defines the 80s is the color sound symbols. Yeah. For sure, God, that sticks out. Even today, you see, yeah, a, a lot of red. I always, I always typically see drummers with like red drums, red heads, red cymbals. <laughs> it's like, it's super cool looking. I mean, I've never actually played them. Um, how do you think they 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 stand up um, quality wise? Because you, s- someone might look at it and go like, oh, that's a gimmick. The symbol can't be that great. You know, H- how do you like them? Well, my understanding is that there were two thousand twos. Sure. And you you could tell from the lathing because two thousand twos have a very distinct type of lathing where it's not it's it's asymmetrical. It gets tight and then it widens out and then it gets tight again and then it widens out. Hmm. Uh, it's kind of like the the grooves of a record, and you have these kind of w- wide areas between songs. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, my understanding is is what uh, Pisces did was they had to produce an an extra bright version of the two thousand twos, and then they coated it with a lacquer for the color and that tended to, to dampen the symbol and dull it down. So they, they, they pre-emphasized yeah. the brightness to counteract the fact that it was going to be muted and, and, and duller sounding. Mm. And it was the era of MTV. And you see all these new wave bands, especially from England, these guys are playing color sounds and it just, I mean, it falls right in with the whole visual aspect of the big eighties with the hair and the big clothes and the makeup and, you know, everything was bright and shiny and new and neon and technology and, you know, yeah. it's just a, a, another innovation. You know, yeah, it, totally. It really, you know, and they were wildly popular. I mean, they were all over the place. I just, I remember every week a new video would come out from, from some new band and, hey, the guy's playing color sounds, you know. Yeah, totally. Did they... Did the color with the lacquer, was the technology figured out right away, you know? I mean, did they have it buttoned up or did they start to like chip off or were they pretty, you know, uh, durable? Uh, as far as I know, I mean, if, if you clean the symbol, if you use an abrasive cleaner, the, the, uh, the lacquer will come off. You'll see it. It'll start to work just like the labels themselves, the colored labels. Yes. If you use an abrasive cleaner, 
what will happen is the high spots will wear out first, which is areas that are between the lathing grooves that stick that stand proud or, or stick up higher mm-hmm. on the symbol. Those will be worn out first. So you'll see that on old color sounds. You have to be really careful not not use a really abrasive uh, cleaner. The other thing about the color sounds is again, I, I a little quip that I saw was supposedly um, Nick Mason had asked Pisces to produce all white symbols for him. Cool. Um, for the wall tour in 1980. Wow. Now, I've never seen any pictures of that of him playing white symbols, but supposedly that may have been the spark at the beginning of the idea of actually applying a colored lacquer to the symbols. Yeah, I mean, Nick Mason, man. I mean, he uh, having a big player like that could really pull some uh, some weight. So, all right, so color, and then and then let's keep chugging along here because we're we're close. I mean, we're we're in the 80s. I feel like it. It you know we're in the it says on the wiki here a couple times that we're we're still in the golden era, the second golden era. Is that pretty true? I mean, this would be the the rise of the 2002s and all that stuff. Is that kind of what constitutes the quote unquote golden era? Yeah, that's that's kind of my personal little saying that I like saying, it, you know, because this is the era that I, I grew up with and I was playing drums and, you know, Again, this is pre-Sabian. I mean, Sabian didn't really come onto the scene until '83. As I, you know, I I knew, but I found out the details from listening to your your Andy Zildjian podcast, which was mm-hmm. great. Yeah, thank um, you. But yeah, I, I, you know, it was, and, and you know, again, my personal point of view was Zildjian was kind of resting on their laurels, and Pisces had all these, you know, new young bands and and. The music style had changed, the look had changed, and Pisces was right there, you know, right, right in the moment, you know, supplying what what needed, what, what the you know new new bands wanted or needed. Um, yeah, totally. One of the one of the big things that happened too during this era, if, if we go to '86, is what I call the Great Phase Out, and that is when Pisces did a major shift and and discontinued a, a whole bunch of their lines and. and in some ways, they semi discontinued the 2002. But there's a story I have behind this, and again, you kind of have to be around my age. A lot of younger listeners don't realize that there used to be a different Coke, mm-hmm. and <laughs> yeah. there was in in '85. I was working in a liquor store, and the new Coke came out. And what what uh, Coca Cola had determined that people needed a new flavor. And there was all this competition. They used to do these taste tests with Pepsi and how everybody preferred Coke. But for whatever reason, they decided, their marketing department over has decided, you know what? We need a new flavor. We're going to retire the quote unquote old Coke and we're going to come up with the new Coke. Well, the new Coke was softer tasting and it didn't have the snap that the old Coke had and it failed miserably. Now, there's an, a parallel to that with the 3000 line. And the 3000 was supposed to be the replacement or, or was the replacement for the 2002. And in Robert's interview, he talks about how he didn't think the 2002 would last into the 80s. Mm-hmm. And they were always striving for new sounds and new development. And he felt at that time that it was time to, to design a new symbol to replace the 2002 to keep up with the current music trends. So the 3000 was very similar Hmm. to the 2002. And I actually owned one along with all my 2002. So I was able to do an AB comparison every time I played played the drums. And what I noticed was it was a more aggressive sounding cymbal. It had a stronger mid range. Um, They had larger bells relative to the 2002s. And it had this odd lathing that was very flat and shallow compared to the, the deeper grooves you would see on the 2002. And... The 3000 kind of really went the same way as the new Coke. You know, people, I'm sure they were popular, but what happened was that, was that as soon as the 3000 came out, there was this big demand for 2002s. And Pisces was trying to move away from the 2002 and focus their production on the 3000. They couldn't because people kept asking for 2002s. Yeah. So the 2002 continued through that whole period while the 3000 the 2000, the 1400, and the 200s were produced. The other factor that was part of this was, and again, this was in an interview I read with either Robert Tumas, was the 404 and the 505, especially the 505, was too expensive to produce. Um, the 505 
production wise is so close to the 2002 that I, I'm making the educated guess that um, Peisty was not making any money off of it, or maybe even losing money. The, the, the amount of labor involved to produce that symbol was almost the same amount of labor it took to produce a 2002, yet in the catalog, they were 30% cheaper. Yeah, so it just doesn't work. Yeah, and again, remember, these symbols, they're, they're hammered, they're machine hammered, they're manually machine hammered into shape. So they have the same manufacturing process as the 2002s, the 602s, and the sound creations. You know, the big difference is the amount of lathing, you know, there's little things here and there that they will, they will omit to bring the amount of labor down to reduce the cost. But with the 505, they're just, you know, they would have to raise the price a substantial amount. So instead, what they did was they transitioned to this new series, and the 1000 was supposed to be the replacement for the 505. But construction wise, the 2000 was really the 505, hmm. but the 2000 was more expensive, if that makes sense. <laughs> it's, it's funny because it's just a ton of numbers, but I think uh, yeah. we it does make sense. I mean, it's. It it makes me think too with like the whole taking the two thousand twos away and thinking we gotta innovate. That can sometimes be the uh the double edged sword of being such an innovative company where it's like you're doing, you know, the color sound symbols and you're doing all these things and the other companies are kind of copying you a couple of years later to to keep up with you. But it's almost like you can't forget what people really like with your classic lines like the two thousand two and such, you know, where it's like don't take them away. Keep them going. One of the other driving forces, too, is my understanding is that 2002 sales numbers would start to drop. Hmm. So, you know, Pisces looks at their sales numbers and said, okay, well, 2002 is losing popularity. You know, it, it's not fitting with, with the times, with the styles of music that are out now. So let's develop something new. So they develop something new and release it. And then the customers are like, well, wait a second. We, we like 2002s. We, you know, we yeah. want to keep, we want to keep, you know, don't, don't discontinue them. So all of a sudden, Demand shoots way back up again. So the price is okay. Uh, geez. All right. Well, we got to go back. <laughs> yeah. You know, honestly, it's funny because I think that same thing. I, I remember listening to some podcast or something about the history of Coke, and um, it talked about that about how once new Coke went away and old Coke came back, numbers skyrocketed. Where it's like, it's almost like a a you create a uh like a rush on the market with your own pro- taking your your popular product away. And then yeah. bringing it back, it's it's that's got to be a business um, tactic. I don't I don't think they did that as much as like a you know just a lucky happenstance of like oh no it's back and then they sell a bunch. But um, definitely an interesting further parallel to New Coke. Um, but yeah. so all right on your timeline here, eighty six is really kind of where it stops. And even on um, Peisty's website, it goes eighty one to today. It basically says. Um, uh, looking at t- Peisty's history on their website, the company gains a firm foothold in the world's largest musical instrument market with the establishment of Peisty's America, uh, Pi- of Peisty America in California, which we talked about. Tumas's son, Eric Peisty, is sent there in the late 80s to look after Peisty's U.S. operations. In 2003, Eric assumes overall responsibility for the family's business. So Eric Peisty gets involved um, in the 80s and then takes over in 03, which... It's in the it's in the family. Who who is Eric's? Uh, you may have said this before, but who who is Eric's father? He's the son of Tumas. Okay. Or I, I was recently contacted, and and somebody mentioned that it the traditional pronunci- pronunciation is Thomas. Thomas. Okay. So okay. I don't know which is correct. So we can go either way. Yeah, both. But yeah, but that's um, good to say them both. The one thing that is really important with the with the timeline um, post eighty six was the the Pisces Signature Series, and the Signature Alloy. Mm-hmm. And um, again, this is a, another innovation with Robert where they were starting to see issues with Swiss metal in the 80s as far as I, I believe their 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 financial status. Um, again, I can't be more specific than, than that, but I think they were kind of on shape, shaky ground by the time you get to the mid to late 80s. Yeah. So that may have been part of an incentive uh, for Robert to develop a bespoke uh, new alloy. And um, the the intention was to replace the B20 symbols and specifically the 602, but also to make something new that was quote unquote better, you know, 
than the 602 and maybe take the best qualities of B8 and B20 and combine them into a new alloy, which will give you both, you know, the, the, the classic sound of B20 and then the nice high end that B8 has. Hmm. Uh, and you end up with really what is B15. I mean, I've looked at the patent for, for the signature alloy and they state something like 14.8 to 15.2% tin. So it's basically B15. Which you don't, um, you don't hear about those different, uh, you hear about B8 and you hear about B20. You don't hear about the other yeah. Bs, you know? So the, I, again, I mean, this is, you know, Piesty innovation. It's, it's amazing that, that um, you know, that they would come up with something like this. And the story goes that Robert had tried several different mixtures, uh, you know, B10, B12, B15, you know, yada, yada, yada. And he found that he liked the sonic qualities of the B15 alloy the best. You know, they, they were producing, they would make a symbol out of these different alloys. And this is what, what he really liked. So he decided to go with this. Now, my understanding, not to get too technical, is if you stay below B12, which is 12% uh, 10, the alloy is what's called single phase, which means that the copper and tin are completely mixed together. And there's, there's no uh, issues with rolling, which is the advantage of B8 and the fact that it can be rolled cold and it's relatively easy to produce. Mm. But once you get above B12, you get into the B, B20 range where you have to do all of this heating and cooling and tempering and then reheating to roll it and then reheat it. Every time you roll it, you have to heat it up and be very careful with the, with the temperatures and, and very precise. So B15 falls into this range. It's somewhere in between that they still need to have a hot rolling stage at some point, roll it hot, but the last stage you can roll it cold. And I have this crazy story from Fritz where Fritz was actually involved with Weiland Works, who was producing the B15. And they originally had the B15 produced, uh, I believe, in the Czech Republic. And they had all these issues, and their very early signatures were actually produced with this alloy, and they had a lot of cracking problems. Mm. And they moved the production to Weiland Works in Germany, and they did some tweaking on uh, how they produced the alloy. And they were able to produce an alloy that was much more uh, stable and reliable. But Fritz told me the final process when they do the last cold rolling stages, the alloy actually cracks on the surface. You get the surface cracking. And what they have to do is they have to machine or grind off 20% from each side mm, to, wow. to, to grind down past the cracking area. <laughs> so you lose 40% of your material right off the top before you're actually even able to make a symbol out of it. So Jeez. he said this is the reason why signatures were so expensive, especially in the beginning when they were released, was the cost to produce the alloy was, really, it was more expensive than B20, actually. Now, the wow. question is, why? Why would they do this? Well, because B15 had the sound that Robert wanted. This is what he wanted. And it really was, you have to produce this at any cost because this is, this is what works. So, you know, the next time you're playing any kind of B15 symbol, you know, if it's a traditional or a signature or anything like that, just know that there was a lot of hard work in producing that symbol and that alloy. Totally. You know, it's, very, it's very special. Yeah, even the the development of figuring that out of like how to how much to shave off and all this stuff is just it's just insane. But that's Peisty in a nutshell right there. Um, yeah. Well and and their partner Wyland Works, who took over with the producing of of all their alloys. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. Has, has, has been very good. And that's also, you know, part of the industry, the fact that they're using, you know, a large, you know, foundry mill that has a lot of experience and it's not a, a home brew type of production they're using what the best term could be is the scientific process so they're very very accurate with their their production and the process and very consistent with that alloy yeah totally man um so we're getting obviously close to the end here and uh i've i've promised people you we won't have another <laughs> as much as people might want uh, three hours total of Piesty history. We'll keep it relatively uh, shorter. But so talk a little bit about as we wrap up the the, the new B20. And I know our friend uh, Fritz Steger was involved in it. So what's the deal with that? So um, I believe it was 
was it 2011 when the new 602s were released? I could be wrong on that, mm-hmm. on the release date. And then, of course, there's Vinnie Caliuta with, with the Modern Essentials, which I was blown away when I saw that. I mean, I couldn't believe they got, they got Vinnie. Yeah, for sure. Peisty Pi- got Vinnie. I can't believe this. <laughs> you yeah. know, they might as well have gotten Buddy Ritz to endorse them. You yeah, know? totally. Really. So my understanding from talking to uh, Fritz, he actually was had firsthand involvement with this. Um, Wild and Works was producing B8 for Peisty. You know, Swiss Metal was gone by 94, um, was out of the picture. And Wild and Works is producing their B8, and they're producing the B15 for Peisty. And Wyland on their own decided, you know, we're going to – we're going to take a run of producing B20 and we're going to offer it to all the, the modern symbol companies, which would have been Minel, Peisty, Sabian, and Zildjian. So there was a book published in 1937 by a doctor, a, a, a PhD, a, a, a metallurgist who did a scientific analysis and research of the B, how, how you produce B20. You know, the temperature it's melted, how it's mixed, what temperatures you need to heat the material to before you roll it, how quickly you cool it. You know, I mean, and you know how the Germans are. I mean, they're so good with industry and so specific with these types of things. So he basically wrote a recipe book, a cookbook on how to make B20. Hmm. So this is common knowledge, I guess, in the industry. And Wyland went through the book and they had their own metallurgist and they produced B20 again, according to the cookbook. So they would produce this quote unquote perfect form of B20. And from conversations with Fritz and his conversations with Wyland works, he found that the reason why 602s had a particular sound and they don't sound like Zildjian and Sabians, a lot of it has to do with the manufacturing of the alloy itself. That is one of the big factors in why 602s sound the way they do. And as Fritz referred to it as the quote-unquote hi-fi sound. And a lot Mm -hmm. of that is 602s have that sweet, crisp high end that Zildjian and Sabians don't have. So long story short, um, Wyland starts to shop around the B20, and they take it to Peisty. And, you know, Peisty is just about to start the production of the Master Series. So they've got... uh, uh, foundries in Turkey that are actually producing the B20 form. So they're not interested. So Wyland at some point uh, uh, contacts Fritz, and I believe Fritz helps Wyland contact Meinl, and Fritz brings some blanks to Meinl and says, hey, check this out. Here's a new B20 that uh, that Wyland is producing. And Meinl says, oh, this is interesting. Okay, let's check it out. And Meinl produced, and I believe in the early 2000s or mid-2000s, what was called the M series. And that was their B20 line that they produced from Meinl's B20 alloy. Fritz went to do his interview with Robert Peisty, I believe, in 2006, and he brought the blanks with him, the, the B20 blanks mm. from, from uh, Wyland Works. And I don't know exactly change, but Fritz told me that while or before or during the conversation, he mentioned to Robert, hey, by the way, I've got these B20 blanks. And Robert says, well, what are you talking about? He said, let me show them to you. So Robert was very interested. He says, yes, leave them with me. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. he he liked them. He Fritz told me there were some minor changes they made, but that was the basis for the reissue 602s and the modern essentials. Now, Wyland also shopped that B20 to uh, Sabian and Zildjian. And Sabian and Zildjian both turned them down. And to quote Fritz, Sabian and Zildjian told Wyland, we're not interested because we could produce it here cheaper. Which mm. makes sense because it's, it's very expensive to produce things in, in, yeah. in Germany. Yeah. You know, the labor costs and whatnot. And obviously, Wyland's going to mark it up. But it would be funny that either Zildjian and or Sabian, if they decided to use that B20, they would use the same alloy that were being was being used both by Monel and Peisty. I thought it would be, that would be very funny. That would be a very <laughs> interesting scenario. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Wow. So, it's so cool how involved Fritz is and, you know, has been with this stuff. I mean, it just, it just goes to show that someone like him, I feel lucky that, uh, 
he has provided so much information and along with all the other people we've we've mentioned in the first episode um really to make these this history possible because it's 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 kind of tough to put it all together and, and like we did with the opening uh housekeeping kind of thing of this um yeah. of it's still sort of evolving and inf- new information is coming out um along the way so man it's just unbelievable and and as people are probably figuring out that it's like we were pretty heavy on the early, you know, era and then, you know, early 1900s through, you know, uh, the eighties. And, um, there's still, I'm sure there's still plenty of other stuff to cover, but really we're, we're kind of, that's kind of our sweet spot is up till like nineties and stuff. And you just obviously touched about on, on later stuff there, but, um, yeah, it, it's just, uh, I think it, it's fair to say that it was business as usual then. And with Eric Peisty running the company, everything seems to be going very, very smoothly. And they're just, an absolutely dominant um, force in the symbol world today. I mean, there's no denying that. Yeah. And, and, you know, they continue to innovate. I mean, I'm, (laughs) it's hard for me to keep track of, of um, all the different lines they produce. And I mean, it's, that's the Peisty way, you know, Peisty has always found a way um, to be innovative and, and creative. And it's, you know, it just never, ceases to amaze me and and they're still catering to the modern taste of musicians what what musicians are interested in and you see that with the masters and 20 series where they've got you know very dark very earthy sounded symbols which people are really into now they've got a lot of of really trashy noise making type of symbols with like pstx yeah um you know i love the fact that they're producing giant beats and 602s and and the modern essential 602s and Obviously, they're still producing 2002s. You know, those are all, all my old school favorites. So, you know, I'm I, I'm glad that Peisty really has something to offer to literally everybody. Absolutely. That's a great way you to know? put it. There's something for everyone. Um, so yeah. maybe if you're listening to this and you are like a player of one of the other brands, um, go out and get some Peisty symbols because um, obviously they're, they're unbelievable. But I think most people have played them and know just how great they are. Um, but Cool. Well, Dan, let's tell people here. Um, well, first off, thanks to everyone who's listened to both episodes all the way through. Um, that's a whole lot of Peisty content. You're like at over two and a half, almost three hours of Peisty history, which I think is is really cool. I was, like I said, very surprised at like the day I released it, how many people were like, this episode was great. Can't wait for part two. Um, <laughs> so they, they seem to, they, everyone seemed to enjoy it. So I hope everyone liked this one too. Um, uh, let's just tell people, I think the best way to, to see a lot of your documentation of all this would be on symbol.wiki, um, and click the Peisty tab there and you can go yes. and see a lot of this. Um, yeah. And it's pretty obvious, but you can go to Peisty.com, P-A-I-S-T-E.com. And then you can see, you know, everything Peisty is doing today. Um, and I've met a few folks at Peisty, like I mentioned in the first one, um, and they're just super nice people, and I'm I'm just so happy that I could finally do an episode um, about Peisty itself. A, a word about the wiki. Um, the one thing I want to mention, and I mentioned at the beginning of the pod, of this part of the podcast, is you know the wiki is ever expanding, ever growing, and there's always updates and changes. So uh, you know, obviously, I try to be as accurate as possible, and a lot of times you'll see question marks or asterisks next to a particular date or a statement. And that's because it's a lot of times it's hard to produce any kind of hard evidence. And some of it is sure. word of mouth. You know, this person talked to so-and-so at Peisty and this is what they said. So, you know, take that, you know, take what you read with a grain of salt and that we've made our best effort to be as accurate as possible. And I've got some great sources. Obviously, the knowledge I gained from Fritz has been exponential, you know, and it's been really hard to to digest all of it. Yeah. Um, but you know. We, you know, the the people that that work on the wiki have made a really, really hard effort to try to be accurate. Um, there's a lot of detail stuff. I, I originally got involved with this because I wanted to collect Pisces. That's how I got involved with the wiki, and I want to learn more about the history and what would be an interesting symbol to to buy. Not necessarily for value, but more just I, I was really interested in their B8 history. Mm-hmm. So that's how I really got involved with the wiki and it's, I got sucked in, you know, yeah, totally. and it's just, was just a case of more and more and more. The more I learned, the more I wanted to know. And, 
You know, it's fascinating. But the information is hard to come by, especially if you go back before the 70s and especially before the war. The information is virtually non-existent. So yeah. yeah, that said, I mean, virtually anything, especially when you're looking to try to date a symbol, it's really important with with the prices people are asking now for symbols and a warning that there are people out there that are trying to sell, you know, lower level symbols. I've seen a few people will try to sell like Bigel Silver Ludwig Standards and ask, you know, $350 for it. And it's no. This is, you know, a mid, lower, even entry level symbol, and it's not worth three hundred fifty dollars. So sure. it's, it's important to understand what you're looking at and to date it and to know what model it was and, you know, its intrinsic value and are, you know, are you really willing to pay that much? But yeah, that being said, that is some of the the incentive behind producing the wiki. You know, is education so people understand, you know, what Pisces are what, where they came from, how they got to where they are now. You know, it's it's a rich history. Absolutely. And, fa- and a fascinating history. Yeah, totally. Which isn't over. Um, there's plenty of Piesty, uh to come. It's not going anywhere. So, yeah. All right. Well, again, thank you to everyone um, who we mentioned in the last episode. I mean, I guess real quick, we'd say like, I think Steve Black, I believe you said Todd Little, right? Was yeah. a big help to you. Um, yeah. Fritz Steger, uh, Raphael Zimmerman. Um, Let's see, Tim Shahady from Peisty, who talked to me a little bit at, at some of the shows and stuff. Um, and obviously, Dan, thank you very much. So uh, again, everyone, Dan Garza has been our amazing guest and uh, our, our guide through the history of Peisty for this two-part mega episode. So um, Dan, thank you so much for doing this and just really taking all this time and effort and redoing things and finding stuff. It's just been amazing. So I, I really appreciate you getting this Peisty history out in public and letting me be the way you, you did it. I'm honored. So thank you for being here. Thank you. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at drum history and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future until next time. Keep on learning.